Our previous video taught us what public speaking is all about. One example of this activity is a debate, a competition where two groups with opposing views argue over a certain controversial issue. And our topic for today has something to do with that. Hello guys, it's Teacher Adam again. Welcome to English class. Before you get yourself into a debate, there are landmines that you have to recognize and avoid. These landmines are the flawed reasoning and rhetorical errors your opponents may bring on the table. If you are sharp enough to notice them, then you will have a higher chance of winning a debate. And to help you with that, our video for today focuses on logical fallacies. Fallacies are common errors in reasoning that will undermine the logic of your argument. They can be either illegitimate arguments or irrelevant points and are often identified because they lack evidence that supports their claim. Avoid these common fallacies in your own arguments and watch for them in the arguments of others. There are 12 types of logical fallacies. Here are their definitions and examples. Number one is slippery slope. This is a conclusion based on the premise that if A happens, then eventually, through a series of small steps, B, C, so on and so forth, X, Y, Z will happen to. Basically, equating A to Z. So if we don't want Z to occur, A must not be allowed to occur either. If you do not get that clearly, here's an example. If we ban Hummers because they are bad for the environment, eventually the government will ban all cars, so we should not ban Hummers. In this example, the author is equating banning Hummers with banning all cars, which is not the same thing. Number two is hasty generalization. This is a conclusion based on insufficient or biased evidence. In other words, you are rushing to a conclusion before you have all the relevant facts. For example, even though it's only the first day, I can tell this is going to be a boring course. In this example, the author is basing his evaluation of the entire course on only the first day, which is notoriously boring and full of housekeeping tasks for most courses. To make a fair and reasonable evaluation, the author must not attend one but several classes and possibly even examine the textbook, talk to the professor, or talk to others who have previously finished the course in order to have sufficient evidence to base a conclusion on. There are so many considerations to take. Number 3 is post hoc ergo proctor hoc. This is a conclusion that assumes that if A occurred after B, then B must have caused A. For example, I drank bottled water and now I am sick, so the water must have made me sick. In this example, the author assumes that if one event chronologically follows another, then the first event must have caused the second but the illness could have been caused by the burrito the night before, a flu bug that had been working on the body for days, or a chemical spill across the campus. There is no reason, without more evidence, to assume the water caused the person to be sick. 
Number four is genetic fallacy. This conclusion is based on an argument that the origins of a person, idea, institute, or theory determine its character, nature, or worth. For example, the Volkswagen Beetle is an evil car because it was originally designed by Hitler's army. In this example, the author is equating the character of a car with the character of the people who built the car. However, the two are not inherently related. Number five is begging the claim. In this fallacy, the conclusion that the writer should prove is validated within the claim. For example, filthy and polluting coal should be banned. Arguing that coal pollutes the earth and thus should be banned would be logical. But the very conclusion that should be proven, that coal causes enough pollution to warrant banning its use, is already assumed in the claim by referring to it as filthy and polluting. Number six is circular argument. This restates the argument rather than actually proving it. For example, George Bush is a good communicator because he speaks effectively. In this example, the conclusion that Bush is a good communicator and the evidence used to prove it, he speaks effectively, are basically the same idea. Specific evidence such as using everyday language, breaking down complex problems, or illustrating his points with humorous stories would be needed to prove either half of the sentence. Number seven is either or. This is a conclusion that oversimplifies the argument by reducing it to only two sides or choices. For example, we can either stop using cars or destroy the earth. In this example, the two choices are presented as the only options, yet the author ignores a range of choices in between, such as developing cleaner technology, car sharing systems for necessities and emergencies, or better community planning to discourage daily driving. Number eight is ad hominem. This is an attack on the character of a person rather than his or her opinions or arguments. For example, Greenpeace's strategies aren't effective because they are all dirty, lazy hippies. In this example, the author doesn't even name the particular strategies Greenpeace has suggested, much less evaluate those strategies on their merits. Instead, the author attacks the characters of the individuals in the group. Number 9 is Ad Populum or Bandwagon Appeal. There is an appeal that presents what most people or a group of people think in order to persuade one to think the same way. Getting on the bad wagon is one of such instances of an ad populum appeal. For example, if you were a true American, you would support the rights of people to choose whatever vehicle they want. In this example, the author equates being a true American, a concept that people want to be associated with, particularly in a time of war, with allowing people to buy any vehicle they want, even though there is no inherent connection between the two. Number 10 is red herring. This is a diversionary tactic that avoids the key issues often by avoiding opposing arguments rather than addressing them. For example, the level of mercury in seafood may be unsafe, but what will fishers do to support their families? In this example, the author switches the discussion away from the safety of the food and talks instead about an economic issue, the livelihood of those catching fish. While one issue may affect the other, it does not mean we should ignore possible safety issues because of possible economic consequences to a few individuals. Number 11 is straw man. 
This move oversimplifies an opponent's viewpoint and then attacks the hollow argument. For example, people who don't support the proposed state minimum wage increase hate the poor. In this example, the author attributes the worst possible motive to an opponent's position. In reality, however, the opposition probably has more complex and sympathetic arguments to support their point. By not addressing those arguments, the author is not treating the opposition with respect or refuting their position. Number 12 is Moral Equivalence This fallacy compares minor misdeeds with major atrocities, suggesting that both are equally immoral. For example, that parking attendant who gave me a ticket is as bad as Hitler. In this example, the author is comparing the relatively harmless actions of a person doing their job with the horrific actions of Hitler. This comparison is just unfair and inaccurate. Now that you already know what logical fallacies are, it's time for us to check how well you comprehended our lesson for today, and that is through homework number 26. Directions Log into your Schoology account. In your homework folder, locate the file to know the complete instructions. For questions, send me a message. Don't forget to submit your work before the deadline. Before this video ends, let's have a quick reflection. Here is a Bible verse related to our lesson for today. Matthew 7.15 Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Our topic for today informs us about a kind of statement or reasoning that is considered wrong. They are called fallacies. Same with these, the Word of God warns us against false teachings. As the days get more evil, there are people who will rise and claim to be from God and with God, but they have evil desires. Mainly, their goal is to bring people away from the truth of God's Word. So we all have to be careful with this kind of people. It is a must that we study the Bible day and night and stick with its teachings. This will protect us from the enemy's deceit and lies. But do not worry, because God will give us wisdom and understanding to know who is for and against Him. Praise be to God! It's now time for me to say goodbye. Thank you for reaching this part. If you have questions and clarifications, send me a message or let me know about them in our live class. You may also book a consultation schedule with me. I really hope that you learned something from this video. So, see you on the next one. Stay safe and God bless.